Hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our second in the LGBT Health Certificate Series. Today's session is, um, is actually in partnership with a couple of other folks here on campus. So I want to give a shout out to our Department of Internal Medicine that partnered with us to be able to bring in Dr. Henry Ng to Louisville and do grand rounds, um, both for medical education grand rounds and for um, the certificate series and for internal medicine. So um, thank you so much, internal medicine. And then also this is in partnership with our undergraduate medical education office here within our medical school. So a shout out to you and me. <laughs> Thank you for helping us to put this program together today and be able to offer CME um, to our, our physician and faculty folks. So um, a couple of quick announcements for us as we get started. Um, so earning a certificate is wonderfully easy and fun. And the way that you do that is you attend five sessions over the year. We offer 12 sessions total over the year. If you attend five and um, Three of those need to be what we're calling interprofessional sessions. And when you see our flyers hanging up, you'll see little stars and a note that says interprofessional next to the sessions um, that we would consider core competency uh, information for anyone from any of our health sciences schools. And so attend three of those and then two of your choice. Many of those sessions are geared towards specific schools. So I want to show those to you as well. So as you can see, some of these sessions are interprofessional, and this is, this is taken from the flyer. So you'll see these flyers up in the various schools. Some of these are interprofessional, and then some of these are medicine-specific or nursing-specific, public health-specific or dental-specific. So for example, we have a wonderful speaker coming in um, that's co-sponsored through our dental school from Adia, and he's going to be talking about, hey, are gay teeth different? Why do we need to be talking about sexual identity in the context of dentistry? He's going to do a great presentation for us that I think will be really illuminating. And then, for example, in the nursing school, we are going to be working with a group of volunteer standardized patients from the LGBT community um, and providing an opportunity to practice um, taking a social history in a way that would be inclusive and affirming to people in the LGBT community. So those are just a couple of examples of other programs coming up that are very specific to certain schools. You are, however, welcome to... Um, to go to any of the sessions for other schools. That is completely up to you which of those two sessions that you want to do for your certificate. So take a look at those and come to the ones that are most interesting and most helpful for you. Um, a little bit about today's session. Today's session is really focused on helping us gain a better understanding of a new landscape for best practices in working with transgender patients. Um, so this has really evolved over the past 10 years, and it was so exciting to be able to ask Dr. Henry Ng to come here and give a presentation on this, um, because there can be still a lot of confusions about, you know, in the past, this is what we used to do, um, what is it now, and people have different um, just access to that information. And so I'm so excited to have him here. Um, Dr. Ng is the founder and director of the Pride Clinic in Cleveland, and that is an LGBT dedicated clinic within a hospital setting. He's the current president of GLAMA, the Health Professionals Advancing LGBT Equality, and that's a national organization of health professionals. He's clinically trained in internal medicine and pediatrics, and also comes with a public health background. Um, so Dr. Ng will be talking with us today. Uh, we do have Mike set up here in the audience because uh, we thought that we would have quite a few questions coming from our audience today. We have a lot of folks here from the community. So um, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Henry Ng. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, being able to uh, come to Louisville and enjoy this wonderful city, this great weather, your warm hospitality, and to be able to talk about, uh, I think, a very important topic for many of us who work in the area of sexual and gender minority health. But before I go into that, I do want to uh, ask you to join me in a moment of silence and recognize the individuals who were lost on 9-11 many years ago.
thank you for your uh, indulgence. And I think it's just important to, for all of us to acknowledge the people who have come before us, the people who were lost, and also the, their dedication to all the work that we continue to do today. Let's start talking a little bit more about transgender health and transgender medicine. And we, I'm using the term medicine as broadly as possible. It's not going to be a talk entirely focused on the hormonal and medical and surgical management of transgender people and their health. Um, it's a very important uh, and oftentimes can be the central reason why people may come to see us in, in various health settings. But at times, what I've taught in um, our primary care settings is, is that the importance of the work that we do is to provide health care, which is primary care plus. So all the things that we do in a traditional health care setting for all patients, health screenings, mental health screenings, different types of um, well child, well adult care recommendations. These are all things that we will continue to do for our transgender patients. And there are a few other things that I want to be able to point out to you that we will also do that also will benefit their health and ultimately hopefully improve the outcome of health uh, for transgender populations. So again, these are some framing type questions. I, I know that we don't have an audience response system here uh, this afternoon, but you know, you can think about you know, where you are in terms of the clinical sites for those of you who are clinicians where you work and for those of you who might be health professional students and trainees where you're doing your training and the types of careers that you may want to have one day. And you know, think about what the infrastructure is like here in Louisville at the university and the various areas that you're coming from you know, in terms of thinking about, well, how would we address some of these health issues based on whatever resources we have and the gaps that we have? So think about the responses to I or my clinical site currently provides the following services for transgender patients. A, a mechanism to indicate preferred name. B, a mechanism to indicate preferred pronoun. C, gender neutral or unisex restrooms or washrooms. D, cross-gender or gender affirmation hormonal therapy. E, transgender experience mental health providers, both either as direct care that's co-located with the clinical services that we offer or uh, through any type of referral process. Uh, F, referral to surgery for facial feminization surgery, any type of top surgery, meaning breast augmentation or mastectomy, bottom surgeries of any kind, reconstructive surgeries or deconstructive surgeries, oophorectomies, removal of the ovaries, hysterectomies, removal of the uterus, penectomy, surgical removal of the penis, vaginectomy, surgical removal of the vagina, metodioplasty, orchiectomy, and a number of other types of surgeries, legal assistance, or any other type of assistance for name or gender marker change for our patients in terms of their paperwork and identification. I don't serve any transgender patients, that's H, or I, I'd like to serve transgender patients by doing that currently. Now, most of the time when I'm giving this, con this uh, talk in the various communities throughout you know, a lot of the United States, um, including areas in large cities on the coasts where we think, oh gosh, there are a lot of services in New York City and San Francisco. Well, they're clinics, they're resources, yes. But when we think about the landscape of healthcare, the majority of respondents are still kind of at H and I. Those are the kind of uh, different areas where they're focusing. And sometimes the, air, the clinical sites have a smattering of some of the other uh, types of mechanisms or resources available. But all these are really important in delivering transgender health care. So we can also think about some of the barriers that may be present in preventing us from providing the best type of care possible and having the best uh, type of outcome. So for me, barriers to providing transgender health care include, A, I didn't know that the services were important. B, a lack of institutional support, which I do not think is the case here at the University of Louisville. C, I've not been trained to provide the services safely, which is oftentimes very common. D, I have concerns about insurance coverage for my patients and clients. E, I'm concerned about medical liability. Will I become you know, a targeted provider if I do something wrong? Am I assuming any type of greater risk for my organization because I'm going to do X, Y, and Z type of care? F, I don't know what the resources are in my community to better do this work. G, I'm concerned about creating a new set of problems. This is opening up the Endora's box. Why stir the pot? And then H, I do not serve any transgender patients. So these are some of the things I want you guys to be thinking about as we go through the, the presentation slides today. Um, and hopefully we'll you know, be able to, kind of, some of the stuff maybe review in terms of uh, some of the constructs of sexuality and gender and language. 
um, but we want to make sure that we're able as a group of healthcare professionals to develop inclusive and respectful language when working with sexual and gender minority people, including transgender folks, gender nonconforming folks, gender non-binary folks, and to be aware of where can we find the resources and the best care practices that do exist in terms of describing the healthcare opportunities and um, guidelines for transgender people and then be able to describe elements of delivering patient-centered transgender health services in many different settings, including in a, or in a primary care setting. So uh, my disclosure, again, this is who I am. My work as a clinical director. Any type of uh, dis uh, discussion of medications today will be um, off-label because they're not FDA approved. And I'll go through a framing case of an initial patient that we saw in our clinic um, actually, when I was a second year resident, so this is a, it's been two minutes ago. And, um, but this is a patient that I've never forgotten, and she was really instructional, I think, in terms of some of the health issues and social determinants and, and whatnot. And again, as a person that we can kind of think about and refer to um, as we talk about this. I'll try to talk a little bit about um, historical transgender health research in terms of what's been described in the literature, uh, as well as the dis diagnostic and statistical manual and evolution of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health Standards of Care. We'll talk a little bit about cultural competence in terms of Trans Health 101, in terms of nomenclature and pronouns and language, and ways to create a welcoming environment of care for our clients and patients, and also then highlight some uh, issues related to both the clinical competence and the different types of care protocols, and then some of the lessons learned from our center where we've been providing care for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people since April of 2007. So let's start with our first person. So LH was a 21-year-old trans woman. She came to our emergency department with a complaint of increasing abdominal pain. Her belly was hurting all over the place and had been hurting for a couple of days. Now, those of us in medicine, we kind of go through this process of describing the uh, the dimensions of any type of symptom, especially pain. So those of you who are students and medical students or nursing students might hear PPQRST, so palliating, provoking, severity, radiation. So we're asking all these types of general questions that we would find, and we're asking about systemic symptoms also, like is there something affecting the entire body? Are you losing weight? Are you having blood in your stool? Melina, which is dark, tarry stool, a change in bowel habits. So far, all this stuff is negative and benign. You know, we asked her, well, did you get hurt? We know that trans people sometimes may be injured or attacked, or maybe just simply just had an accident. You'd fall down and hit your belly. No, none of those things happened. She didn't eat anything odd or different or anything like that. She wasn't losing any weight. That was a good thing. She didn't throw up. So, okay, well, the next thing that we do is we do a, a physical examination, All right? When we get the history, examine the patient. So, you know, she was... You know, in no apparent distress, she looked comfortable, she was breathing comfortably. She was androgynous appearing. Now I, I say she because this was a pronoun that she wanted to use um, when I first met her. Um, but her hair was longer, she wasn't wearing makeup, she wasn't wearing long nails, she had kind of a baggy t-shirt or sweatshirt and then some form-fitting jeans on and tennis shoes. And, you know, in terms of other measurements, of her health, we looked at her vital signs, her heart rate, her pulse, her temperature, all these things were within normal limits and okay. And well, we were gonna focus on her tummy since she said that my belly hurts, Dr. Ring, please fix my belly. And you know, we'd press a little bit, ow, 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 but not a chandelier sign, didn't press on her and she left off the exam table or anything like that. So because you have a symptom of abdominal pain, I offered to perform a, a genital exam and a rectal exam, but my patient declined and you know, that can certainly be challenging for us as clinicians. Um, they also had explained the medical importance of doing that, but still couldn't quite get her to let me perform that examination that particular day. The rest of her exam was otherwise completely unremarkable and normal. She didn't have any past medical history, social history. She was taking medications, um, a hormonal medication called Premarin. It's a conjugated equine horse estro uh, 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 estrogen prescribed by an endocrinologist. She had known, known alcohol allergies. Um, in terms of her social history, she was a non-smoker. She drank alcohol socially, never had a DUI, never had problems with alcohol, was not using any types of drugs, no illicit drug use. At that point, she was working um, at one of our local gay bars 
as a drag performer, and her family history most notably was negative for any type of gastrointestinal disease. Again, kind of focusing back on a presenting symptom of belly pain. So this is actually an opportunity for y'all in the audience to have a moment of participation. So what type of other information do you think we would, would be important to obtain? And if you do have something, raise your hand and come to the mic and say it out loud. Okay, come to the mic, sir. Had she done anything to try to treat it? Had anything made it better or worse on her own accord? No. Good question, though. Anything else? How about in the middle here? Please feel free to come, come up to, to the... Oh. All right, you're loud enough. Project. Not yet. I said history, not lab test. Good try, though. Anyone else? Any family history of blood clot? No. Anybody else? Bueller? Bueller? Oh, up front here. From her house. No, no long, prolonged travel or anything like that, no. Did I leave anything out in the history? Thank you! All right, amongst many things, there was no sexual history. So we, we went back and we, we, we got some of that. And a little bit more. So let's see what we learned. So she was single. She partners with males. She was using barrier methods, condoms for receptive intercourse inconsistently. So sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, in terms of her anatomic inventory, she still had a penis and she had testes. And she denied having any penile symptoms uh, associated um, with the abdominal pain. She denied any rectal symptoms or pain or discharge from that part of her body also. Now also we dove back and we asked a little bit more about her medication. And um, she was prescribed Premarin, uh, uh, 1.25 milligrams to take twice a day, which is a, a reasonable therapeutic dose. Um, of this particular medication, but she'd been taking around 10 milligrams twice a day for most days for the last couple of weeks. And when I asked her why, she said, well, I, I really wanted to see more development of my body than what I was seeing. I've been on this hormonal medication now for about a month, and, you know, this is just not what I was expecting, so I thought if I took some more, maybe I'd see more development. And she also told me that she had attended a pump party. She had paid about $500 for a beautician, someone who's non-medically trained, to inject silicone of industrial grade into her breasts for augmentation purposes. So there's some stuff going on. I mean, there's her abdominal pain, but then there's all this other stuff that's going on that we have to try and figure out. And, you know, things, again, to consider for our patient and any patient that we come across is, you know, are there some primary medical issues? Are there some social issues? You know, are any of these things specific and um, related to her particular experience of being trans? Are they related to any other factors that are important in terms of her social um, or her health or any social determinants? You know, imagine if this patient was somebody who came to you in your health center, your clinic for aftercare after they've been sent in the ED. Ultimately, what we decided with her, we did some lab tests, we did LFTs amongst other things, and we found out that she had some elevated liver enzymes, and we attributed this to the super therapeutic use of the medications. She didn't have other signs or symptoms that suggested that she had like Bud Chiari or you know, a mesenteric uh, vein thrombosis or anything like that. Um, so we recommended actually for her to take less of the medication, the dose that was originally prescribed, so that hopefully there would be less medicine-induced hepatitis is what we ultimately decided that she had and recommended that she follow up with her endocrinologist. But you, know, you have to think about you know, patients like LH can and do present to our clinics, sometimes with this story or sometimes with other stories, and how well are we you know, prepared to address their health concerns. Well, there is a body of research that we can look to, and I thought the, the body of research actually was really interesting. Um, the, the, the experience of transgender people has been, I think, documented better in different forms of um, 
history uh, in many different cultures around the world for millennia. And the medical literature, we really haven't seen that much written about it until you know, the 20th century. And in um, particular, you know, Caldwell's work in 1949 identified um, this as an early diagnosis of psychopathia transsexualis. And it is kind of negative as it sounds. So I, I highlighted it in red, you know, part of this original document, um, some of the, the language that surrounded uh, the description of people who were transgender, or well, who we consider as transgender today, but how this was visualized or, or treated, you know, only about 50, 60 years ago. So amongst both sexes, individuals who wish to be members of the sex to which they do not properly belong, their condition usually arises from poor hereditary background and a highly unfavorable childhood environment. Such an individual is psychologically mentally deficient. And that's simply that one is mentally unhealthy and because of the person's desire to live as a member of the opposite sex. So this is one of the beginning ways of how we saw you know, transgender experiences, transsexual experiences, gender nonconforming experiences become kind of categorized in the medical literature. And those of you who are familiar with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual are aware that after World War II in the 1950s, we began to try and collect information about a lot of different individuals as they're especially returning from um, the war and they're experiencing many different symptoms. And we tried to put those into categories that made sense in terms of providing them care. Because if we can figure out what condition you have, at least we'll have a better sense of what we should be treating and how we can make it better. Well, this, is, this process went on certainly for people who are transsexual. And we looked at, you know, I looked at the a PubMed review of just using the MeSH term transsexual. And there were 996 uh, identified uh, PubMed entries as of last week. And in, I could look through and kind of thumb through these and look for general themes. And you see in the 60s, sort of initial case reports, case series, this was not a very common experience that people as health professionals came across. So they would describe the cases that they saw. And they also did some endocrine studies and psychological studies. Well, what were the experiences of these people like? What was their thinking like? Um, what type of hormonal levels or anatomy did they have? And then in the 70s, we started to see the evolution of some surgical reports and outcomes and cross-cultural studies. In 1976, we saw the article of starting to describe a case report of one of the known um, major side effects of, that could be negative and devastating for cross-gender hormonal therapy, which was pulmonary embolism in a transsexual man who was taking diethylstilbestrol at that time. In the 80s, we saw a number of psychological studies and some initial follow-up studies on cohorts of transsexual men and women especially those who were living overseas in the Netherlands. Um, and then in, it wasn't until 1986 that we saw one of the first initial articles describing HIV and AIDS amongst transsexual individuals in the world. Meanwhile, we had started to see literature in the, uh, in the early 80s about GRID and eventually what was known as AIDS and HIV. Um, and then in the late 80s, we started seeing some additional papers describing breast cancer and other types of uh, malignancies, as well as some additional surgical procedures that were more advanced for genital reconstruction surgery. But this is just short of a thousand articles in the last 50 years. So there's a dearth of information. Even in a thousand articles, a lot's been written, but a whole lot hasn't been studied. There's a lot that we're lacking in terms of our understanding. We also tried to categorize the experience of being trans in the DSM. So, you know, and, and as the slide actually says from the American Psychiatric Association, where lists kind of got longer and bigger um, in the context of a growing list of mental ills. So transsexualism was first included um, in the DSM-3 in 1980. And then at that time, gender identity disorder was a term that was created um, to regard to people who were otherwise transsexual or transgender. So our choices that we could pick at that time for diagnosis would include gender identity disorder in children and transsexualism, GID adolescent adult non-transsexual type, or GID not otherwise specified. Do not ask me what those mean. They were confusing to me now. Then we saw updates and revisions. That's what the R generally means in the DSM. Um, so we saw in um, the updates in DSM-4 
that gender identity disorder got renamed for adolescents and adults and replaced the term transsexualism, although some old health records uh, and electronic health records might still actually have that previous diagnosis. Um, and then uh, the names were then also changed in the DSM-4 to describe gender identity disorder in children, gender identity disorder in adolescents or adults, or GID not otherwise specified. And the big shift has now come with DSM-5 which was published in 2013. And the DSM-5, and this is again from one of their um, descriptive PDFs about the, the DSM and how it's trying to, to capture the diagnosis. And um, this is after a lot of discussion internationally between health professionals from the World Professional Association of Transgender Health giving feedback specifically to the American Psychiatric Association um, and the team who were working on the revision for this diagnosis in DSM-5. But the goal was to respect the, uh, the patient and ensure that the patients could get care. And we want to avoid stigma and make sure that people can be themselves um, of a different gender than that was what, whichever was assigned to them. So you know, the term gender dysphoria has now replaced gender identity disorder. And there are a number of um, characteristics that I've highlighted again in red that um, for the criteria for, this, for someone to meet gender dysphoria, there's a marked difference between that person's expressed or experienced gender and the gender that others would assign to that person. And this has been present for at least six months, if not longer. That there's a clinically significant distress or impairment in one or other uh, areas of functioning or uh, of day-to-day uh, -day life and may be manifested in a number of ways in terms of symptoms and that there's also a post-transition specifier. Now, you know, this diagnosis, some people, including myself, still find perhaps a little problematic in the sense that uh, gender dysphoria certainly can be a diagnosis that makes sense at the very beginning of someone's treatment in terms that some individuals may experience significant dysphoria in terms of their anatomy, their presentation, the way they see themselves. But many individuals, at some point, they become, I guess, normal phoric, maybe not euphoric, like a static, but you, you lose the dysphoria or the dysphoria is significantly minimized to a point where there's not that lack of functioning or inability to function in day to day. So what diagnosis do we use at that time to continue using medication? So this has certainly been one of the areas. Do you stay still dysphoric for your life or at some point does that improve? But you know, with this uh, criticism, this is still the diagnosis that is available um, for use on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Now, this is not the only diagnosis that might be used. Many of us in the field who take care of transgender and gender non-conforming, gender variant, gender awesome people will also use terms of uh, the diagnosis endocrine disorder not otherwise specified, which is 259.9 in the ICD-9 code. So I want to point out that you know there still is ongoing research, and a lot of this research um, is focusing on a lot of other topics and areas that are really kind of going beyond the initial scope of some of the early research that we saw that looked at social determinants of being trans or the etiology of being trans or complications of care for being trans uh, or surgical procedures of uh, gender confirmer, uh, confirming surgeries. So we'll, we'll see some um, of the titles here, non-prescribed hormonal use and barriers to, uh, for care for transgender women in San Francisco, transgender health disparities, comparing full cohort nested matched pair study designs in a community health center, mortality amongst veterans with transgender related diagnoses of the VA administration, breast cancer and transgender veterans, a 10 case uh, series, and characteristics of transgender women living with HIV receiving medical care in the United States. So we're starting to see a lot of intersectionality between social determinants, health outcomes, and a deeper dive into the experiences of what trans people are actually having on a day-to-day -day basis as part of this research. So, you know, we, we're moving forward. We still have lots of opportunity to do uh, research and fill educational and research gaps. So those of you who might be interested in trans health research, please consider it. Uh, there's a great opportunity to fill that gap. But we're going to now shift gears and talk a little bit about Trans 101. So it's a, hopefully a quick review for some of you guys um, in the contracts of sexuality. So there are four constructs that I think are really important for us to be able to dis uh, describe. Biologic sex, which has to do with, or simply sex, which has to do with uh, the genitalia that most individuals have um, and the way it's presented and the way it's assigned 
of, of value of either male or female at birth. So typical uh, presence of a vagina or a vulva uh, in terms of health professionals, we assign that as a value of being female. The presence of penis and testes and scrotum, we tend to assign that as a value of male. There are certainly times where we'll have individuals when they're born that may have genitalia that do not fit a stereotypical pattern. There may be either a phallus a, a that appears smaller or a clitoris that appears longer, or there may be different types of scrotal raffle labial folds or sinuses that are present. In those cases where it is indistinct and unclear the sex of that individual, then we may say that there may be intersex condition or a DSD. Uh, disorder of sexual de uh, development that may be present, and there may be additional tests that we may perform, for example, a karyotype to try and understand the sex chromosomes that are uh, present in that particular individual. They may be XX, XY, X0, XXY, XYY, or a mosaic pattern, or a combination of many other things. At times, also, we may identify individuals who may have had changes in uh, or unexpected. Uh, uh, stalls in their physical development. For example, individuals who had sex assigned at birth female and they have primary amenorrhea. They did never had menses by the age of 16. Some individuals are found to actually have feminine um, uh, or rather androgen sensitivity syndrome uh, where that certain parts of the reproductive tract never actually were, no, never were formed. So those individuals also may fit under this area of intersex um, although they themselves may not consider themselves part of an intersex community. But the first construct is sex. The second construct is gender identity. So this is simply how you see yourself when you close your eyes. You think of yourself and you see yourself in a particular way, being masculine, feminine, maybe a combination of the two, maybe on one side or another. And there's certainly maybe many different words that can be used to describe this center area. Some people use the word queer, some people use the word gender queer. There are 15,001 words I've seen that have been used to describe this center location. And that's something that we certainly want to be able to identify with our patients and get a sense of what language they're using to describe how they see themselves. And to realize that not everyone necessarily will fit in a binary system where they're in female woman identity or male man identity. Your gender expression has to do with how you show the outside world how you see yourself or not. So it really depends on a couple of things. One thing is how secure and sure are you in your own gender identity and how comfortable you are showing the outside world that identity. So I, gender expression is culture specific and culture bound. So there are different ways to express masculinity and femininity across the world in different cultures, including Western civilization and Western culture. So when we look at this picture, anyone know who this is? Jazz, yay. This is an old picture of Jazz, of course since she is now like 16 and I think she's like the cover girl or clear sill. 14? Okay. She's in her teens. Um, and she's, she's certainly all grown up. Um, but, you know, many people would say, gosh, she's, you know, very, very feminine. Well, how? Why? And people in other audiences said, oh, of course, look at her dress and it's pink and this headband. And, well, again, these are, you know, culture-bound ways that we express um, masculinity or femininity in a particular culture. So we may do that in certainly a polar or a binary way, or we can do that certainly in a way that may be non-binary or a combination or androgynous. Now, the way we show the outside world who we are may be congruent with the way we see ourselves, or it may not be. If we are in a particular environment that may not be particularly supportive of who we are and how we see ourselves, maybe it's not safe for us to express ourselves in that manner. So sometimes, for example, in clinic, we'll see individuals will present a congruent to their gender identity, um, but at times they may not. Finally, sexual orientation is the last construct and it has to do with who you're attracted to, who you'd like to kiss. This is the idea of do you like Beyonce and want to kiss Beyonce or do you want to be Beyonce? All right? Or you can put in any other you know, pop star, whomever you want. All right. But Beyonce works still. Um, so again, this has to do in part with identifying who you're attracted to and how the object of your attraction uses language to identify themselves. So for people who are non, you know, gender binary, queer identified, you know, words like homosexual, bisexual, lesbian, or gay in terms of describing a sexual orientation just may not fit. 
So it's important to recognize that we can give people an opportunity to figure out, uh, rather to select and choose and tell us what word for orientation might fit for them, but it's actually not her job or role to place that label upon them. So this is going to be all summed up in an infographic with the gender bred person 2.0, and there's a 3.0, of course. Or, of course, you can also use the gender unicorn that provides, again, a non-binary opportunity to identify people's attraction, identity, expression, and uh, emotional and sexual attractions to others. You know, I have to love any time that I can put rainbows and unicorns in a slide. All right. So that's a quick review of the constructs of sexuality and gender. And I want us to now, again, switch gears and talk a little bit more about how we can create a welcoming environment of care. And we need to think about the language that we just reviewed and the terms and the, um, those constructs as we begin training others in the way we try to communicate. So, you know, we know that, unfortunately, transgender individuals can have a lot of issues in terms of their health experience amongst other experiences. So there was a uh, survey performed by the National Transgender Discrimination, uh, rather the National Transgender, Transgender Discrimination Survey, which was conducted in 2011 by the National Center for Transgender Equality, um, titled Injustice at Every Turn. It looked at over 3,000 adults who were transgender and their experiences in housing and health care, employment, public, uh, use of public accommodations, and found you know, a number of really challenging negative findings. There's a current uh, uh, national survey, again, for transgender people, um, and enrollment is closing soon, but please uh, make sure that people are aware of that and do participate if they can. But from the data that we have available, we know that negative experiences in health care are unfortunately too common that nearly one out of five individuals who are transgender and gender non-conforming have been refused care simply for being transgender, that health professionals are unfortunately uninformed about the type of care that we need to provide transgender individuals. And this makes sense. There's been a big gap in health professional education, definitely medical education, nursing, social work, education over the years. We're beginning to try and make this better. However, we're still only touching generally the superficial topics of gender, sexuality, constructs, and we really haven't gotten to a deeper dive for a lot of the other things. That's part of the reason why we're having this discussion today. Um, rates of HIV certainly were very high, and also um, the delay in care um, was also very, very concerning that amongst transgender adults, when they were sick or injured, many of them postponed medical care over a quarter because of previous negative experiences due to discrimination, or nearly half because of problems with affording the, the treatment. It was just financially too difficult for them. Um, those of you who might have been present at uh, my, my discussion at the Grand Rounds for Internal Medicine may be familiar with these slides. Um, so this is from my Twitterverse friend, uh, Parker Malloy. And you know, I, I remember seeing these tweets described, I think, on a BuzzFeed thing on social media um, at the end of July, and it really opened my eyes because you know, our patients are certainly taking to the Twitterverse and the interwebs and you know, actually to our hospital systems and they're tweeting at our CEOs. They're letting people know when healthcare is failing them. And you know, I saw this hashtag, trans health fails, and it really resonated with me. It spoke to me about the, the absolute abject failure that health professionals and health systems have had in terms of addressing the health needs of transgender people. And that this is a very painful way it's being pointed out for all of us to finally take a look at it. Now, the slide is actually small, and so I'm going to read this for you. Um, it says, there's this time that I had to take a pregnancy test before getting a chest x-ray despite lacking a uterus. Trans health fail. And then there are more of them. Nurse, when was your last period? Me, never. I'm transgender. Nurse, you really fooled me. I thought you were a woman. Hashtag trans health fail. I'm sorry I don't specialize in transgenders, but here you can find that online. Hashtag trans health fail. I saw a specialist psychologist for ADHD assessment who asked about my surgical status. Hashtag trans health fail. A nurse tried to call me back for my appointment, but then shouted, that can't be you. This chart says male. Hashtag trans health fail. My hormone doctor recently dumped me because they're overwhelmed with patients and they can't handle them all. Hashtag trans health fail. You know, I, I think that it would be amazing if at some point in, in the next 
weeks to months to years that we would be able to create a healthcare infrastructure and training and experiences where we see trans health win, trans health success. But this is our reality of our healthcare systems at this point in terms of challenges with access, education, training. There are a lot of gaps. So, you know, things that we can do to begin to close some of those gaps and better uh, create a welcoming environment is to assess and address the clinical environment itself. You only have, we only have one chance to make the first impression. And misgendering oftentimes can happen certainly out of uh, the perception of somebody's gender identity or expression, and it may not be done intentionally with any type of malice. But in any case, if it happens, harm has been done. We have an opportunity to reflect and think about our use of language that could be gender binary. We've been taught to use this language in part because it's been polite. We were used to saying ma'am and sir, but it automatically binary addresses somebody in a way that is a perception, and sometimes we may be wrong. So think about you know the, the, the difference in meaning between saying how may I help you versus how may I help you sir, how may I help you ma'am especially when we have not necessarily identified or checked in with somebody about their gender identity. There's an opportunity for us to create mechanisms to identify preferred names, an alias, preferred pronoun. These can be the traditional masculine and feminine, or they may be third person neutral, singular. They may be the use of they, them, there. There may be the use of mix or MX in terms of a prefix for identifying somebody. Now, using a prefix that's gender neutral without asking somebody, that's still misgendering somebody also. So we cannot just apply these when we don't know. The goal is to be able to create mechanisms that allow our clients and patients to tell us more about who they are and then correctly use them in referring to that person. And then what do we do when we misgender somebody or misname or dead name somebody, the use of the name that's not the preferred name or may actually be a name that's changed from the legal name. You know, there are ways that we can address that if we say, oh, I'm sorry, that I did not mean to use that name and um, which is not your preferred name. Thank you for correcting me. Could your name otherwise be, uh, your chart be under a different name or what is the name on your insurance? I'm sorry for using the wrong name or pronoun. It was not meant to be disrespectful. Our own introductions can be very, very helpful. It's actually a standard way that I encourage our students and trainees to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Dr. Rang. My preferred pronouns are he, him, his. Now for my cisgender patients where this doesn't matter, it kind of goes right over their head. They kind of look at me for three seconds and then they move on. But for the patients where this does matter, they've just realized I've opened the door for a conversation about gender that's on my radar and I'm happy to talk about. So there's certainly ways that we can improve the, the environment of care for trans people. Um, for those of you who have an ability to influence the um, electronic health record, you can think about you know ways or there are ways to track preferred names, alias, pronoun, uh, preferences. We can certainly conduct various types of health trainings, things that we can adapt from today's talk that can be done on a smaller scale in various clinical areas. You can look at your organization's policies around the health equality index. You think about signage for things simple as restrooms. Does it say restroom, washroom, or bathroom? Or does it say men's room and women's room? Most people know that my pet's peeves is to call it a restroom because you go to the restroom to rest, you go to the bathroom to bathe, you go to the washroom to wash. How do you man in a men's room? How do you woman in a woman's room? I just don't know. When someone figures that out, please let me know. All right. So in our clinic, in our clinical environment, some things that we do, we create some workarounds because our electronic health record doesn't always have fields to capture all of these things, but that's okay. We'll still use good old-fashioned pieces of paper and let people fill things out and tell us about who they are. So they can write down their pronoun status, or rather their pronoun choice or relationship status, preferred name, and additional health information. And when we work with patients, we oftentimes on the first visit will talk about um, what to expect in terms of overall goals of care and talk about uh, mental health and other things and provide informational um, resources for our patients. And we always have learners in our clinic because service is very tightly uh, associated with educational opportunities for our trainees so that we can make more folks who have the sensibility, um, clinical and, and uh, cultural competency to take care of trans patients. 
So our learners have a chance to have education and training before they have a clinical exposure. They'll review the WPATH standards of care, social determinants, and practice language so that if there are any flubs, we get to do it in private first. So we'll finally talk about clinical competency and talk and introduce um, the standards of care in this context. Um, so Dr. Harry Benjamin certainly was very important in um, the history of transgender health and health care. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health was initially named after Dr. Benjamin as the Harry Benjamin International Gender Dysphoria Association. And again, he was one of the first folks to work with people with gender dysphoria. And over time, this has evolved to the standards of care that we have currently, the seventh edition of WPATH standards of care. And also we have the Endocrine Treatment of Transsexual Persons um, by Dr. Hemery and others in 2009. Sure. I'm try to aim my mouth at this thing. Um, so the standards of care have evolved over time. Our traditional model was this triadic uh, uh, care model where it was really implied that there was directionality, that folks were not trans enough unless they actually had surgery. It was implicated that they would. Um, the, tr the traditional models prior to 2011 was assigning a mental health diagnosis, like gender identity disorder, transsexualism, or one of the other ones that we talked about, and it required something called real life experience. What we probably would consider more social transition at this point, living in the role that you see yourself in, that feels most natural to you. However, this was mandatory and required as part of treatment before one would be able to start hormonal therapy. And a lot of people still are familiar with this particular model and ascribe to it, although this is not the only model of care. A letter of support or reference was required from a PhD level mental health specialist, a sexologist or whatnot. And we know that they're really easy to get these letters because there's so many people trained to do this work around the United States. And the letters basically said that you're not crazy, there are no significant comorbid mental health conditions that are not otherwise being treated that this patient meets the criteria for gender identity disorder at that time, and that there was mandatory psychotherapy as a prerequisite for starting hormonal therapy. You got one letter for hormonal therapy, you got two letters for any type of surgery. What has evolved since 2011 is that there's an appropriateness of describing an informed consent model that is an alternative way to provide health care and hormonal care for trans-identified individuals and non-gender um, binary individuals. So many different diagnoses may be appropriate for use in addition to gender dysphoria like endocrine disorder not otherwise specified. Mental health is certainly encouraged for all adults uh, for coping and support but is not a requirement for the initiation of hormonal care. Real life experience is not required. And then prescription of medications can occur after a medical evaluation obtaining of informed consent. Now, the informed consent hopefully um, will describe that if we start medications, the risks and benefits and alternatives to different types of treatment. And amongst those things to describe are the ways that medications can affect individuals. So that we think about their fully reversible interventions, partially reversible interventions, and finally irreversible interventions. The ones that are considered part, uh, fully reversible will be the use of hormone blocking agents or uh, medroxyprogesterone to otherwise suppress estrogen or testosterone production. This will delay puberty. And this is usually something that's used in adolescence, in early adolescence, when young people are just beginning to have some physical changes. These medications really have minimal role once individuals have gone through a feminizing or masculinizing uh, puberty overall. Now, partially reversible medications generally are starting cross-gender hormonal therapy that will masculinize or feminize the body. And uh, for most individuals, we're talking about starting this potentially at age 16 or older according to the current guidelines. And we say this is partially reversible because if you're taking hormonal medications for a short period of time, perhaps it may not have an irreversible effect on reproduction. But then again, it could. So we're not always sure, even with short-term use. And we generally consider irreversible interventions those to be of surgical nature. So a general approach to clinical care can be actually looking at your patient population, saying, well, how many of these folks are adults, and how many are teens, and how many are pediatric, and that we're going to individualize the care for all of our patients, but we can generally use an informed consent model for our adolescents and definitely for our adults, and that an initial visit that we meet people and we're thinking about 
figuring out what type of care they need, we want to get a chance to know who they are, get a health history, psychosocial history, general, exa a general examination. The more uh, intimate physical exams can certainly be delayed to another time when you've developed more rapport with the individual. They're not absolutely medically necessary at that first visit. We can certainly introduce the informed consent process and talk about goals of care and also review some of the key elements of the standards of care and the Edgerton Society. And in our clinic, we give our patients opportunities to ask lots and lots of questions. We give them a ton of resources in terms of support groups, mental health, connection with other trans people, trans families, um, parents of trans young people, if that's helpful for them. Um, and then sometimes we do blood work at that first visit. Sometimes we'll do it at a later visit. The initial health assessment for folks who are interested in cross-gender hormonal therapy will include a thorough history and examination, a personal family history of cardiovascular, breast cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. We'll ask about hepatitis, cholithiasis, or gallstones, and venothromboembolic phenomena, meaning the development of deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary emboli, which are the forma formation of various clots in different parts of the body deep in the venous system. We'll ask about a history of any prescribed or medically unmonitored hormone use. We'll also ask if individuals um, have may have, uh, especially uh, trans feminine identified folks, have used silicone injections in the past. We'll ask about mental health and screening. We'll talk about treating any undiagnosed depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, or other mental health concerns. So tools like the GAD-7 PHQ screening tools may be very helpful and useful in your clinical settings. And certainly we'll also talk to our patients about any use of substance use or abuse. Again, you can get a sense that that's really kind of primary care-ish, all right? So at the return visit, you know, we'll oftentimes either, if we've, draw, if we've drawn laboratory tests at the first visit, we'll kind of go over those um, findings and then describe, you know, if there are any um, lab abnormalities that suggest that maybe something's goofy going on in one of the organ systems of their body that requires additional investigation. We may complete additional physical examinations as appropriate. And our goal is to make sure that we've answered all questions things regarding reproduction, contraception, prevention of pregnancy, um, any type of disclosures, meaning who have they told about being trans and how's that going for them? Is that a safe thing? Have they disclosed to friends, coworkers, family? Do they feel like they could use additional support in that regard? We talk about medications. Where are you going to get it from? How much is it going to cost? Is this something covered by your health insurance? The answer is generally no. So how are you going to get that? And then we'll also talk about you know, document discussion in terms of uh, any type of ID that they have and name change and paperwork for driver's license, passport, travel, et cetera. For the hormonal uh, evaluation and repeat physical examinations, we typically see people about every three months for the first year, then maybe every six, and then yearly. There are a number of different resources that have been identified and described to help us follow and decide which laboratory tests to do. And um, one of the great places to go to this is University of California's uh, San Francisco Center of um, Excellence on Transgender Health. And you know we, it's important to remember that if you're going to draw a lab test, you're going to use the reference for the desired gender, because otherwise you're going to be wondering how come everything's all high or how comes everything is all low. So we're starting with a complete blood count, renal function, liver function tests, thyroid function, prolactin level, lipid studies. Um, hormonal levels of estradiol and testosterone generally a baseline, and then usually we'll try to get those if a patient is using injectable forms of medication as a trough, meaning that's the blood level before the next injection. If they're taking oral medications or transdermal medications, then you can get random blood levels. It's not necessary to draw them at any particular time. We drew all these uh, blood tests in part because hormonal medications can impact all these various end organ systems. So it's important to assess whether or not these parts of the body are otherwise healthy first, and if we need to make dose adjustments or to continue um, or consider the initiation of other medications to control or address any other health conditions. We want to make sure we also ask our patients, like I said, about uh, silicone injection use. There can be very uh, significant effects. Uh, for people who use these uh, for body augmentation, you can have issues with embolism, different types of infection, including HIV and bacterial infections and soft tissue infections um, from needles that may have been shared inadvertently. Um, there can be autoimmune phenomena that may occur, especially in individuals who have long-term use or retained silicone of industrial grade in their body. They can develop an autoimmune phenomenon with lupus-like syndrome. Um, you can have local tissue fibrosis, destruction, silicone migration, and certainly poor cosmesis. 
thinking about estrogen therapy, the typical medications that we'll use include uh, estradiol acetate orally, transdermal estrogen, or estradiol valerate, which is injectable. The ranges um, can be from zero to two, uh, sorry, two to eight milligrams orally. Um, the anti-androgen, we generally recommend having some uh, medication directly suppress testosterone. So for those who can tolerate spironolactone, the range of doses is anywhere between 50 and 200 milligrams daily. And then the major side effect of this can be hyperkalemia or elevated potassium levels. There are other medications that can be used um, to some degree as an anti-androgen. However, they do not have the same type of effect that spironolactone does. Um, some people may be on finasteride or dutesaride, Avidar, Proscar, and whatnot, as uh, the function of this particular medication is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. It prevents and blocks the peripheral conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. This works at the tissue level to help affect issues related to hair growth, um, but does not actually otherwise suppress testosterone levels in the body. And uh, there can be association with depressive symptoms with using these medications. Some of the desired effects that we may see with feminization therapy include fat redistribution and kind of an hourglass form or shape, softer skin, fuller hair, breast growth, and sometimes there can be some mood lability. Some less desired or undesired changes that may occur include a decreased muscle mass of seven kilos on average, um, so maybe some degree of anemia that develops. Um, there may be some metabolic effects as well as the risk for osteopenia that can occur and that some individuals at the initiation of cross hormonal therapy with estrogen may um, experience retrograde ejaculation um, and then have to have prostatitis because the secretions aren't moving and leaving forward from the body. We're talking about masculization therapy, then we're usually talking about the use of testosterone. Um, the form that's most commonly used is testosterone subhyanate, although there are other forms of injectable uh, testosterone that are available. The typical range is 50 to 100 milligrams weekly or 100 to 200 milligrams injected every two weeks. There have been studies to show that sub-Q or injections of the medication into the skin as opposed to the muscle in the short term have uh, the same types of blood levels in terms of absorption of testosterone and have not had any significant high, uh, side effects, so it's non-inferior uh, to in uh, the injection IM. Um, there's a gradual increase of dose that's done over three to th uh, every three to six months after initiation of therapy. There's also topical medication that we can use with gels, the patches. Um, the patches oftentimes transdermal form people can develop irritation with their skin and to the adhesive. And then with gel, we have to be really careful to otherwise not inadvertently masculinize somebody um, because of contact with the medication on skin. So we usually talk about putting it under your axilla or whatnot. Again, some of the desired therapy effects will be increased fat, or, or rather fat redistribution from an hourglass more to a triangular shape, increase in muscle mass, a male hat or pattern, but we also may have hair loss. We can have a deepening of the voice, which may become permanent. There can be a decrease in breast tissue that's maximum after 12 to 18 months, and amenorrhea that can happen one to six months after starting hormonal medication. Some of the less desired things, acne, acne, a secondary polycythemia or erythrocytosis, which is the increase in red blood cell mass, um, usually not at the level that we have to be concerned about venothromboembolic disease or hyperviscosity syndrome. There can be a risk for cardiovascular effects as we increase bad cholesterol, the LDL decrease, the good cholesterol, HDL, um, and certainly there can be, again, some changes with mood. In general, the medications, or the labs rather, are um, repeated every three to six months, and then every six months for a year, and then yearly afterward. There's a lot of gaps in terms of our knowledge in, ter uh, in terms of like knowing what the optimal dose is, especially as we age. So, you know, we tend to use lower initial doses with older patients and patients who have lower body mass, and also we have um, less information about the long-term effects on cardiovascular and bone health. Um, we do caution many of our smokers to uh, undergo tobacco cessation therapy as that generally is one of the largest contributors to their risk um, for venothromboembolic disease. And we certainly also want to consider decreasing the dose who, of hormonal medications for people who already have cardiovascular or cerebral vascular disease and also make sure those individuals are on um, secondary prevention like being on antiplatelet therapy. So this particular slide has a nice summary of uh, the medications, the doses, and the approximate cost 
um, for this. So, for example, a, a male to female trans patient who's taking oral estradiol from a dose range of 2 to 8 milligrams a day could be paying about a dollar for every 2 milligram tablet. Um, as an antiandrogen, they could be taking spironolactone, 100 to 200 milligrams a day, and they're paying $56 for 100, 100 milligram tablets. Compare that to someone who identifies as male who's using injectable testosterone every two weeks, and the approximate cost is 53 to $87 for a 10 milliliter vial. And again, these are some of the out-of-pocket costs that our patients otherwise have to sustain because for the moment, um, until significant changes happen at HHS, we have not been able to see that these medications are covered under the Affordable Care Act. The medical complications of cross-gender hormonal therapy actually are pretty nil. Um, in a study done, done by one of the international uh, experts, Gorin, um, they found that the most common uh, outcome uh, was actually was related to venothromboembolism. They looked at overall morbidity, mortality, comparing individuals who were on um, therapy um, to those who were not, and they found that mortality was no higher than their comparison group. Um, the previous studies had focused on the use of ethanyl estradiol, which is more uh, thrombogenic than the forms of estradiol that we're recommending nowadays. So um, that's one thing that we've noticed is that the rates of venothromboembolism tend to be going down. There, um, we also recommend continuous use of cross sex hormones to prevent osteoporosis. You need to have some form of hormones in the body so that you can maintain bone health. Um, this is a, a, a little bit of a busy slide, but this was done um, as a, a meta-analysis looking at um, the different types of complications of being on cross-gender hormonal therapy, and venothromboembolism was the most common complication that was found in a um, meta-analysis of all the addition of these studies that were performed in the last 20 years. So according to the primary author, Asherman, they recommend avoiding ethanyl estradiol, which most of us already do. Um, we can also offer our patients transdermal estrogen that carries the lowest risk of venothromboembolism. Um, VTE still can happen, but much less likely. Most of us will use low to mid-dose oral estrogens. Um, we can also use the conjugated equine estrogens up to 2.5 milligrams a day. So if we think back to our case of, that, of LH, she was prescribed 1.25, but she was taking 10 milligrams a day, so she was taking a whole heck of a lot and could have had a PE. Um, you know, we can consider also discontinuing estrogen or actually testosterone therapy also um, any time, about two weeks before gender confirmation surgery or significant elective surgeries where the, uh, the risk of immobility will be very high. So for example, if you have a transgender patient who's on the inpatient ward, they fell down, they broke their hip. Already the risk of them having a venothromboembolic event like a pulmonary embolus is really high the recommendation would be to have that person not be on hormonal therapy for the duration of the time that they're hospitalized. Obviously treat them with um, anticoagulants as appropriate to prevent venothromboembolic disease. And then as an outpatient, usually a couple weeks after this has, uh, their, their hospitalization is, is done, then to resume hormonal therapy. Okay. Oh, all right. Sorry, there's all the stuff. All right, so other changes can happen in the body. There, there's one. We're in the home strut. This one basically says that, you know, transgender women actually might get lower blood pressures, okay? And also, in the study of trans men, the, the testosterone therapy was increased with increasing their BMI, although these folks in this particular study were actually overweight to begin with. That's statistically important. All right, home stretch. So, billing is a problem, coding is a problem. I've recommended that at least we you'd certainly consider endocrine disorder. It's one of the diagnoses that will be reimbursed and paid for. Insurance is a big issue for a lot of our patients since they don't have a sufficient coverage. So a lot of the medications folks are responsible for paying on their own. And our EHRs unfortunately still have a lot of gaps too. So our health records oftentimes don't have the fields for us to uh, capture a lot of this data. But it would be wonderful if we could have pronoun data in anatomic inventory so we can identify what our patients have. And then in a non-binary system, my trans men could actually have a hysterectomy, or rather, if they haven't had a hysterectomy, they still need to have a pap smear, I can make sure I can code and bill for it. All right. There are different resources available for you to actually look at increasing your knowledge. This is a course offered through the Center of Excellence for Trans Health in the UC San Francisco. And what we learned is if you create these types of services, people come. Trust is built. And when people come, 
they'll start telling their friends. And then more people come. And then they're going to ask you to start doing things that you were not prepared to do, like to see gender nonconforming children for us. So we have to try and be creative and figure out ways to better address those health issues and health needs. But we have a bunch of different health resources that are available for you. And these include books like Trans Body, Trans Selves, online resources, and that's it. Sorry for going over. I really appreciate your uh, attention, and I'm, sure I'm, I'm welcome to hang around for a couple extra uh, you know, moments or for those of you who are able to stick around and ask questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ng, for wonderful information. That's information that is not always easily accessible. We deeply appreciate it. And thank you to all of you all for your time today. Please turn in your evaluations of the session to folks in the back. Um, we have Meg on this side, but if you don't see Meg on the other side, just leave your evaluations on the table for us. Um, so I think Dr. Ng is here for a couple more minutes. If people would like to come up and ask him some questions, you're more than welcome to. Have a great day. Thank you.